Close your eyes. <laughs> I'm looking at the other lady. <clears throat> he staged this whole movie just for today. You're all serious. He had to rent the tux again. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, since I was preaching on marriage today, it was only fitting to use um, the video that I had put together for my wedding. And uh, being married for six and a half months now, I feel like I'm an expert on this subject, so start your seatbelts, ladies and gentlemen. Last week, Nick talked about dating, and uh, it was absolutely phenomenal. He did some really uh, neat things that I can personally learn from, because I think even moving into marriage, I think it's also important that you need to as well continue to date your spouse, all right? But uh, let's go ahead and open our Bibles, Genesis chapter 20, or excuse me, chapter 2, verses 20 through 24. Let's see this. You know, I'll even throw them up on the screen for you just because it's the kind of guy I am. There we go. It says this. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord took, God took, had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is the last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Everyone said, Amen. 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 Let's pray this morning. God, thank you so much for bringing us here. God, we ask that your presence would be with us. And Lord, I even ask that you would soften all of our hearts as uh, some of us may be getting ready for marriage or in the near or distant future we may be getting married. Uh, and Lord, I ask that you would be able to speak something profound to us this morning uh, and let us be receptive. Amen. Lord, that, or Clint, that prayer for you, buddy. <laughs> I got a few statistics on marriage. These are taken from uh, census.gov and barna.org, two very uh, reputable websites. So here we go. For every 1,000 people, 6.8 people get married. Okay? For every 1,000 people, 3.4 get divorced. It doesn't take a math genius to know that that's about 50%. There's a 1 in 15 chance that a marriage will last at least 10 years, okay? 12% of teens felt certain about being married by age 25. That's not a very big percent in my opinion. The average age of marriage for men in the U.S. currently, or in 2010, excuse me, is 28.2, and in 1980 it was 
0.7, so the age has grown about three and a half years in 30 years. The average age of marriage for women in the U.S. is 26.1 in 2010, compared to 22 in 1980. And the number of marriages in the United States in 2010 was roughly 2 million, compared to about 2.4 million in 1980. So obviously we can notice that uh, there are much less marriages actually happening nowadays. All right. Here's a quote from George, or what, I, what can we learn from these statistics? I think that uh, people who are getting married are marrying at a much later age. We see that, it's pretty clear here. Uh, marriage is now seen as optional, I think, as well. It's not necessarily something that you have to do. There's, there's much cohabitation happening right now as well. And most of those who are getting married don't view marriage as a lifelong commitment. We notice that simply with the 50% who are getting divorced currently. And here's a quote from George Barna. He's a Christian uh, researcher who does a lot of research uh, in religious activity across the United States. And here's what he says. There no longer seems to be much of a stigma attached to divorce. It is now seen as an unavoidable rite of passage. Interviews with young adults suggest that they want their initial marriage to last, but are not particularly optimistic about that possibility. There's also evidence that many young people are moving toward embracing the idea of serial marriage, in which a person gets married two or three times, seeking a different partner for each phase of their adult life. The new normal for marriage is that you have more than one. The new normal for marriage is that you have more than one. So what do we do about the new normal? What do we do about this problem that we have that's sweeping the United States and seems as if it's only getting worse at this point? What do we do about that? Three things. Number one, understand that marriage is a union. We see that in the Bible very clearly. Number two, understand gender roles in marriage. And number three, understand who marriage is about. All right? Number one, understand that marriage is a union. Let's look back at Genesis chapter 2. That last verse, it says this, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, right? One flesh. They're no longer two people, but they're now one. They're joined together as a unit, okay? They're not two separate entities. They're a single unit. Now, what can we take practically from this? I think that we can take practically from it that you shouldn't make any decisions on your own, right? Because if you make a decision on your own, that's going to hinder the other person. Because once again, you're no longer two, but you're one, and you shouldn't be making decisions on your own. The marriage is a unit, Right? That means singular. It's not units, it's a unit. It's one, it's singular. You're no longer two, but you're one flesh. Uh, number two, understand gender roles in marriage. Ephesians 5.33 says this. Many of you have heard this passage before. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Husband's role. Here you go. Pretty clear. Love your wife. Pretty black and white to me. Love your wife. Now, men, men are a little bit different than the ladies. Men are like hunters, right? We like to go out. We like to get the kill. We like to gut the animal. And, and we like to take the prize for our own. Is that accurate, gentlemen? Mm -hmm. Okay. They enjoy the thrill of the hunt. The problem arises, however, when there's no longer a hunt after they're married, right? A lot of gentlemen, they get married, and that's their prize. They've taken home their prize, and they've, they've got it, and then they no longer pursue that prize after marriage, and that's a problem. Or, even worse, they go on a hunt for another woman, which obviously leads to uh, adultery, and that's never a good thing. So here's, here's what we learn. You need to pursue your wife, gentlemen, even after you're married, right? Understand that just because you're married doesn't mean that you have the prize, necessarily. Uh, you need to continue to date her, even as Nick was talking about last week, we talked about dating. You need to continue to date your wife even after you're married. Because if you lose that pursuit, you're going to lose your marriage. If you lose that pursuit for her, you're going to lose your marriage. Here's the wife's role. Check this out. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. Ladies, gentlemen need, or lady, excuse me, respect your husband in the future. 
Gentlemen need respect, okay? We need that respect. We need to feel respected in our marriage. Men interpret their wife's actions as either respectful or disrespectful. And uh, I think something else that the ladies need to do is you need to be supportive of your husband, okay? Which we interpret that, your support of us, we interpret that as being respectful. And Paul is very clear here to be respectful of your husbands. So two things here from we, that we learn from this verse. Gentlemen, love your wives. Pursue them. Go after them. And ladies, respect us. That's all we want. Just a little respect. R-E-S-P-C-T. Come on. <laughs> Women interpret their husbands' actions as either loving or unloving, and men interpret their wives' actions as either respectful or disrespectful. There's this really great book that I read for premarital counseling called uh, Love and Respect. It's a book by this guy named uh, Emerson Egrich's. Kind of an interesting name. Um, and his entire premise is basically reflecting on this verse. The entire book is about this verse where husbands you need to respect, or husbands you need to love your wives, and ladies you need to respect your husbands. Because everything that a husband receives, he interprets as either, either respectful or disrespectful. And a wife either receives it as loving or unloving. Now why is this significant? Because when a husband feels disrespected, he has a natural tendency to react in a way that the wife interprets as unloving. And when a wife feels unloved, conversely, she has a natural tendency to react in a way that the husband interprets as disrespectful. So, husbands, love your wives. And wives, respect your husbands. Number three, understand who marriage is about. Let's read uh, Colossians chapter 1. Verse 15 through 17 says this. I'll even toss it up there on the screen for you. But it says this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That last part once again, and in him all things hold together. I think we could even apply that to our marriage where even our marriage is held together by Jesus, right? I have this illustration that Nick brought up last week as well. Imagine a triangle, or look at this triangle. You don't have to imagine it. Look at this triangle for a second. Pretty basic, right? You have G there we go. We have Jesus at the top, because obviously he's the center of our lives, or he's supposed to be. We've got a husband and we've got a wife, okay? So we've got Jesus, husband, wife. Now, if the husband and wife focus on each other, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I don't think it's really what makes a healthy marriage last. If they move toward each other, it doesn't work. Why is that? Because your foundation is built on shaky grounds. It's built on focused on each other, which again not, is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not what we should be striving for ultimately. Our foundation should instead be built on Jesus. Because check this out. When we move toward Jesus, collectively, because once again, a marriage is a unit, when we together move toward Jesus, your marriage will work. And why is that? Because Jesus is an unshakable ground, right? When you center everything that you do on Jesus, it's not going to fail, right? And uh, I think that instead of pursuing each other, you should instead pursue Jesus because as you go up that triangle, you're inevitably going to get closer to each other. But if you just try and pursue each other, you're not getting closer to Jesus, and your marriage is built on shaky grounds. But once again, as you move toward Jesus, you're going to get closer to each other. Your marriage will work. Your marriage will work. Marriage was never intended to be about each other, I don't think. I think that marriage was intended to be about Jesus. I think that's how it was always meant to be. Right? I think we see that from the very beginning of the Bible with, with Adam and Eve, how they actually failed to pursue Jesus, and as we see that the fall happens, and uh, well, here we are today, living in sin. Uh, but when you make Jesus the center, everything else falls into place. And marriage is not just a commitment between a husband and a wife, but it's a commitment between the marriage unit, right? Because we're one, and Jesus. So husband and wife together, collectively pursuing Jesus. And understand these three things. The marriage is a union. Once you get married, you're one. 
You don't make decisions on your own anymore because every decision you make is going to affect the other person. Understand, if you're a husband, love your wives. You've got to go out of your way to do this. It's, it's, it's not easy work. It's difficult. But love your wives. And ladies, respect your husbands. Respect your husbands. And lastly, center your marriage on Jesus. Because once again, as we see here, if you pursue Jesus collectively, you're inevitably going to grow closer to each other. And uh, maybe you're here and you don't know who Jesus is. Maybe you uh, are sort of unfamiliar with him. And you're like, who's that guy at the top of the triangle? Well, let me tell you this. We're going to have some people here who uh, are going to want to speak with you. And they want to introduce you to who Jesus is. And listen, everything that we're here, we're about Jesus. Everything that we do, we're about Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you once again for bringing us all here. We ask that your presence would be with us. And God, I ask that your uh, love would guide us and help us in our marriages. Help us to understand that it's a unit. Help us to understand our roles in marriage. And help us to ultimately center everything on you, Lord. God, we love you and want nothing more than to simply glorify you. And uh, help us to do that through our marriages. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> God bless.